Tonight's speaker, Luna Maurer, is a designer of systems. She is interested in the idea that logic-based design can be used as a tool to understand the ungraspable. This might sound like an ambitious pursuit for a graphic designer, but together with her fellow designers, Rule Wilders, Jonathan Pucky, and sound engineer, Edo Pales, Luna co-authored the Conditional Design Manifesto, a document that lays out this approach, stating that the process is the product and logic is our tool. But this is not a cold, mechanized form of design. Luna readily admits that each process is inherently springing from subjective intentions, and to this end, conditional design in her mind is more closely aligned with the methods of philosophers, engineers, inventors, and mystics. Her design is often an incredibly social thing that encourages collective creativity. Her work with interactive media bridges the divide between digital and analog systems, often relying on deceptively simple rules and human interaction to, co to create complex, organic artworks. Her work intimately explores the, the relationship between people and technology, and she has created a breadth of projects working in a variety of mediums, such as graphic design, interactive design, video, and performance. Born in Stuttgart, Luna was educated first in Germany and then at both the Rietveld Academy and the Sandberg Institute in Holland. Together with Ruhl and Jonathan, Luna recently established Moniker, an Amsterdam-based studio that balances applied commercial projects with self-initiated experiments. Her work has been shown in museums around the world, including the Design Museum in London, the Boymans Museum in Rotterdam, and most recently she was featured here in our graphic design exhibition, Graphic Design Now in Production. She is currently a visiting critic at Yale University School of Art and teaches interaction design at the Rietveld Academy in Amsterdam. Please join me in welcoming Luna Maurer. Good evening. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, lecture series. Quickly make it lower. Thank you very much, Emmet, for the introduction. Well, um, I would like to start with the fact that last time I gave a lecture that was at Yale University about two months ago. After the lecture, somebody asked me, hey, Luna, but why all these rules? And I thought I just start to tell you right away that the rules are there to focus on the freedom and the play that you have within the limitations. And I say that now because we're going to make an experiment and you should keep in mind the play and the uh, expression. So um, to set the right tone for the lecture, fitting to what I'm talking about, we make this experiment. And uh, this is governed by only one rule. It's very simple, which is you, the audience, is becoming me. So, <laughs> uh, but you're not only me, you're also Ruhl and Jonathan. Emmet already uh, introduced it very quickly. I started the studio moniker together with uh, Ruhl Wouters and Jonathan Pucky and um, what we do in our studio is we do a lot of discussing. We discuss projects, themes, subjects over and over again. So uh, what we, you must imagine the scene, you are in our studio and we're having a discussion. It's going to work like this. It's very simple. You speak what is written in the speech bubble like this. We have different uh, colors for Jonathan, uh, is blue, and uh, rule that is green. So um, I'm going to, it works, yeah, hello? Yeah. So I'm going to hand over the microphone now to somebody in the audience, the first one, and you just speak one speech bubble, and then you hand it over to your neighbor just um, in, the, in your row or the one that is cl closest by and you just go through the rows <laughs> towards the back, okay? Just one speech bubble and then your neighbor. So, and please have fun, play and expression, okay? So that's the only thing I demand. <laughs> so. 
let's start then. <laughs> Hi, I'm Luna Maurer. <laughs> I am Jonathan Pukki. Hi, I'm sitting over here. I'm Rule Wooters. Hey guys, I was just wondering, I wonder if we can call some of our works participatory or not. When is something participatory? I don't mind whether you call them participatory or not. By defining them, we could get stuck in definitions and might lose the freedom we need for these experiments. What do you mean, Luna? What are you precisely trying to define? If we use input from the outside world to influence our work, for example, by using other people's voices to speak, is that a participatory act? Don't you think that lettering the audience to speak could become very forced? <laughs> Can you call it participation when they don't have any freedom? They just have to say what we want them to say. Moniker as a puppet master. Ideally, your audience would change the, worlds themse the words themselves. Um, you can't apply that, so. <laughs> All these unique voices together produce the complexity we usually look for. I think they will do their best to articulate and act like stars. <laughs> what I like about it is the blur. Who is speaking now? Are we or the audience doing the talking? Let's just show, show some examples of our work, regardless of whether they're participatory or not. For example, the Leoff project we are working on right now now deals with a similar idea. <laughs> Leoff is an international art festival in Norway that we're creating for the, the identity for. The festival has a socio-political focus and deals with the concepts of antagonism and change. We're using the title of the festival and asking people to rewrite it over and over again. By gradually changing the title, we want to thematize these notions of antagonism and change. You have to explain that we're using Amazon's Mechanical Turk to do that. The Amazon Mechanical Turk is an online crowdsourcing marketplace where people can execute HITs, human intelligent tasks. I love the expression human intelligence task. The tasks that are posted there can't be done by computers. You need human intelligence. It works like this. You post a small task online and announce how much money people will get for executing it. Right. So the task we give them is to invert the sentence, which is the title of the festival. And what we get back we feed back into the website as a new task. Each new version of the title should result in the opposite of the previous title, like a reply that always states the opposite. Show us the outcome so far. Just what is that that makes, oh, just what is it that makes today so familiar, so uneasy? That is the title of the festival. It is a modification of the title of Richard Hamilton's famous artwork. What makes today so unfamiliar, so easy? Well, here somebody made life easy for himself just by switching up the position of un. What makes today seem so normal, yet so violent? After four inversions, the meaning has changed dramatically. Familiar has become normal, and uneasy has become violent. The day seems to be so noisy, yet so dull. Now the question has turned into a statement. This day becomes the day, making it just like any other day. What once was uneasy is noisy now, and what was familiar has become dull. The night seems to be so quiet, yet so exciting. This sentence feels completely different. The day has turned into the night. This one is even stronger than the previous version. The night seems so serene, yet so seductive. 
It's quite interesting to see how quickly something turns from a violent day into a seductive night. Even though with each immersion, people ask to choose their words as precisely as possible, and then we pick the best results. Despite all these inversions, the title still refers to the state of today. Let's go back to my question. Would you say that this is participatory? We, at, we pay people to execute this task. Hey, Luna, why didn't you just rewrite the sentences yourself? I want to integrate the world into the work, the unpredictable factor. The patterns there, that are out there, how does something evolve? We are ending up at points we never could have imagined. Hey, Luna, what's for lunch? <laughs> In fact, we use the Turkers as machines, machines with a bit of intelligence. Is the crowd intelligent? Well, this sentence's development is completely dependent on the brain power of all these people together. When we work with online participation, it's not about using the power of the masses, but about the multitude of what they produce. Every statement is singular and unique. I do think it's about the power of the masses. It's not about a top-down controlled mass, but how the mass organizes itself to collectively produce something. Of course, but within this mass, every individual counts. I think people's individu individuality is expressed as soon as they make an effort and pay attention to what they're doing, if they care about it, and I hope they do. Are we in a muddle now? Are we using the people who participate in our projects as intelligent machines or as individuals? The same question can be applied to this lecture. Is the audience being treated like an intelligent machine or as a group of individuals? I would like to have my voice back. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Thank you. You did very, very well. I love my voice. Really. Um, well, that was an experiment. Um, well, uh, today it is wet before the rainstorm. So that fits when I say that um, our world has become increasingly more complex. New technological developments, digital media play quite dominant role, I would say. And uh, we are confronted with a massive amount of data every day, information which is in a constant flux and change. And um, yeah, you have interactions between people, between people and virtual people, between people and machines. You have interactions even between machines. So in this complex situation, I think as a designer, you have to adapt to your way of working. So it, I believe it is, makes more sense to go with the flow and to make also things that change and grow or where you give away control uh, rather than stop the flow or stop yeah, the, the change. So we as Monica, we try to do that. We do a lot of experiments, such as this one, for example, <clears throat> and we try to use the input from outside to incorporate. And this is a risky thing. You never know really what happens, what you get out of it. But if you don't try, yeah. So we, 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 uh, you could say we design environments in which processes can take place that we are observing. So in this uh, coming uh, lecture, I would like to show you a couple of examples that we deal with input and processes in different ways. 
Wait a second. This is, um, I start with a project that deals with also the intelligence of the crowd and um, uh, where you put people in an environment with a limited amount of freedom. Uh, and this uh, is now extended to a really big series. We call it the Fungus series. It started with this uh, project uh, with uh, Blue Fungus, one uh, execution of it at the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam, the Contemporary Museum in Amsterdam. And it works like this. Uh, every museum sticker gets, museum visitor gets a sticker sheet that you see here. And uh, there's a rule on it, how you um, should place the stickers. It, it says, it's very simple, you should place a sticker in the neighborhood or not further away than the size of the sticker itself. So this is what comes out after uh, three months and about 10,000 sticker sheets has been, have been placed and it went really quickly through the whole exhibition. So it's really something that spreads really wide rather than being condensed at some places. And um, what is, this is about, is, am I hearing like this also? I feel like I have to bend so forward now. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, what this is all about is that you have to collaborate with the others because you have only four stickers. So you have very limited means in order to express, your se express yourself or do something with it. Here you see different uh, parts of the museum. And what is quite nice, um, once you, you, I found out once you glue the sticker on the floor, you cannot just glue arbitrarily. We as people, we always try to make sense. We try to look for something that we can recognize. So you just, or do on purpose something else. On purpose, you don't make it fit to what you see or you try to continue a story together with the others. So there is, isn't such a thing as completely arbitrariness in this uh, work, I would say. Although it might look uh, chaotic or something. Here you see clearly how that it was a group of people together that um, were there. And of course, a very important aspect is hacking the system. As soon <laughs> as you set up a system, you try to look for the borders and the limits, which is the whole thing. The, 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 your creativity is basically stimulated as soon as you get these borders. And then we uh, made another uh, execution because I um, was invited in, in, in Spain, in Gijón, in a museum to do something like that. They are always uh, actually placed these fungus series in a context of digital art because of its generative character, because they slowly grow and, um, yeah, as in uh, digital art is happening a lot. Um, so here I tried, I thought, I just try different shapes. For example, in this case, uh, the sticker sheet had two round circles, a bigger one and a smaller one, and a longer line and a shorter line. And uh, the rule was that you had to connect the line ends and connect the stickers. And you were not allowed to cross lines. And this is how it, uh, um, what happened. And it is of course fascinating all to see, because it was quite a big museum, it had several floors, and it was completely spread like a disease. And uh, so it is fascinating to see this uh, complexity and also this, uh, the shapes that emerge. Although I was also a little bit disappointed because you see quite uh, pretty much nodes and edges, what we know from network visualizations. So it's also that you, the shapes determine very much how you think within it and what you glue with it. So that, um, yeah, you see here some examples for a uh, yeah, more illustrative ways how to uh, apply it. But every time when I design these stickers, I also try things out in what different kinds of ways you could use them. And yeah, 
but still, this I would never imagine. <laughs> then I tried a different thing. I thought, okay, uh, now this shape shouldn't be uh, something that I recognize already in advance, should be more arbitrary even. So this is like just fitting the sheet, the sticker sheet in a perfect uh, way. This, and it's called green grass fungus. And this is uh, in a museum in Amsterdam. Actually, it, this also has taken place in New York in a gallery. And um, here you could say maybe this is a rather less uh, recognizable. Um, it has a less recognizable pattern or more chaotic or whatever you call it. But if you make this, uh, if you zoom in into the details, uh, you start to see small stories in this. So you cannot really um, see it as a... Or it flips always in between an abstract shape and on, at the same time also some kind of uh, figurative, illustrative shape. Yeah, I really like the fact when it's uh, not really clear whether it's now uh, what somebody tried to say with it, but it's always uh, in between. And of course, all different kinds of ways of applying it. Um, oh yeah, the rule I forgot to say was just connect the stickers. There was It was not more complex than that because I found out that you shouldn't really make it too, too complex, these rules, because nobody would read it really anyway. You would just look what you see and you would reply to what you see. So this is the latest experiment for an exhibition in China, Graphic Happiness. And here um, we gave them triangles because of the famous Chinese Tangram. We thought, well, probably people would make uh, the most amazing uh, figures from it. And uh, unfortunately we don't have good documentation pictures sent and uh, this is how it looked. And it was also astonishing because it would say also connect the triangles, but I don't know how it was translated into Chinese uh, because the, the, all the points connected. So I and also believe that um, you probably just look what you see and you reply in the same way to what you see. And also every country really, if you would make the same, principle in a different country it would look different because it also depends on um, the mentality right, really of being really neat and doing exactly what you should do or just going against it um, this project I decided to show because uh, of its extreme character because uh, you have been talking uh, at the beginning about the um, strange word of intelligent machines, you know, people as intelli being intelligent machines. And this is a situation where um, people becoming rather an intelligent machine. Um, this has been a, a poster design for the design biennial in Brno. And um, we were asked to design the poster for to make two copies of the poster, one would announce the exhibition and the other one would be the, uh, exhibited. So ten designers were asked and uh, because of this small, we only had to make so few posters, we made this, we set up this machine and here um, it was in a workshop setting, students were executing it and um, so what they got is uh, they sat in the circle and they got a computer code to execute where they had to place a dot or draw a line with a tape starting at a dot ending at a line and you shouldn't yeah I won't go into detail about the code and then um, I had a gong it was even more difficult because uh, they had 30 seconds to execute the code and then you have to hand it over to your right neighbor and then you had to again execute the code and um, yeah this made them really suffer <laughs> they were really sweating you had to be completely concentrated act very quick 
and um, yeah, I'm not sure whether I enjoyed it, but for me it was a very interesting experiment because um, they were only focused on designing um, the detail, on trying to make their thing right. Yeah, but what is important is actually to say that um, within this very much limited setup, there was the a freedom to choose where do you start at what uh, I show maybe an example where to choose where at what point you start and to what line do you draw your line so within this um, small freedom that was perceived as really really big so you so you enlarge it very much and you would see that um, if people, uh, you would say, recognize something, like a story or somebody would try to make something that you recognize, um, you would also enhance that and also continue making this story. For example, here, um, drawing the line to a certain point, then others would join in. Or here you see these uh, parallel red lines um, going to the yellow dot. So you try to look for some kind of recognizable pattern in this chaos, you could say. Yeah, what I just mentioned, it's, uh, what I like about it as well, is that you're really not busy with trying to make a beautiful thing, but you just, you cannot think about what is now more pretty or not. It's a very quick decision, rather intuitive decision. And you're just busy with his own little detail and not at all busy with the, how the whole looks. This is an um, example, another example for a participatory project um, which has been very successful. Um, it is a music video a crowdsourced music video. We do, we make quite a lot of music videos and right now we are also busy with a new crowdsourced video clip that will be launched in about two weeks. So you hopefully will join in. Um, as you can read here, this has been like more than 30,000 people that have been joining. And I want to show this because um, it is very well designed in matter of uh, amount of limitations and freedom for you as, uh, as what you can do as a participant. And I show you quickly how it works. All right, this is the website. So uh, the video clip is um, consists, so it's shot, the band acting, and is divided all these frames and what you have to do is mimic one frame so here you have your the website I said I start my webcam I allow it and then I get one random frame from from the video so you see here this is quite complicated and then I have to mimic it yeah so I try this it's quite difficult for me right now okay Five, four, three, two, one. Ah, okay, it was bad. Yeah, it says, "How do you do?" And uh, a lot of people say, "I can do better," and then you do over again. So people do really a lot effort here. I just say, "I'm done. I'm fine." What I get back, um, I get uh, the image back and a link to the video clip that I can share uh, on my social network. So um, this is how it works and later after one hour or something like that your frame is rendered into the video. And um, once if you do well because it's also authored by also uh, on a crowdsourced um, with a via a crowdsourced method. And uh, I quickly show you uh, how it looks. Uh, part of the video.
maybe stop here. <laughs> um, well, uh, it is uh, super successful, this video, because it's a lot of fun. It is uh, to do. Um, and it is also, what is important also about this, it is very simple. Everybody has this webcam and you just have to stage or mimic this frame. That's it. But in the same time, you have a lot of freedom uh, what you can do with it. You know, so people do a lot of effort, as you see here, to uh, even have other people help. Or uh, others would make um, yeah, whole installations for it, collages, <laughs> drawings. So, um, and, and I think what is also important, what we realize, is that you get a reward. Always, if you ask people to participate in something, it's really important what do you get back for it? What that you get direct feedback, for example, or in this sense, you see yourself. Um, yeah, and also here is uh, uh, as um, in the previous project I described that you're very much busy with um, only your individual frame that you care very much about, and you're not busy at all with the whole video clip. So this is a very nice side effect that you just. Uh, focusing on the single thing, whereas you're working actually on a bigger project. And um, mm -hmm. these are the portraits that are coming about. <laughs> this is a very other nice side effect that uh, this clip generates beautiful portrait photography, you could say, because uh, people are just not self-conscious. They're not busy with how they look, but they are only busy with um, trying to make the right um, scene. And of course, you have very many different people taking part. It's also very nice to see, and also you see their homes, and you get all different kinds of informations with it. Okay, I thought uh, now um, I first show you a couple of um, works and then now it's time to uh, talk about more in depth what means conditional design that has been already introduced by Amit. Um, it is actually like that. Uh, Ruhl and Jonathan and me, we have a graphic design background. We studied graphic design, but we were very much busy with the role of the computer and um, making projects around that. Books, also uh, print works, but also installations, performances, movies, and so forth. So very, we were working very interdisciplinary. And uh, the rest of the world always had a problem to place us somehow, somewhere, where we were graphic designers or web designers, or what are we now? And we also were bothered about the fact that we couldn't say what we were. Uh, so we came together in my kitchen every Tuesday and together with Edo Paulus, a friend, he's a sound artist, and uh, we discussed about um, our work and these ideas that we have, which were similar, and uh, finally we said, okay, we have to write it down, and uh, it happened that we wrote this manifesto without intending at the beginning to write a manifesto, and um, in a bit I realized also that it is in a way um, um, contradiction when I'm saying at the beginning that you should go with the flow and make things that change, whereas this manifesto is really a, a milestone in a way, you know, it's really like a, a rock there. But also it's very important because we were describing everything really precisely um, that you can also then step away from it and look at it and um, yeah, relate to it and also continue from there and, 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 and yeah, make new things. Uh, I very briefly tell you what is written in it. Well, although Emmet has uh, said a couple of things, I make it even shorter. Uh, it consists of three parts, which is the process, the logic and the input. And you must imagine it very simple. Uh, I imagine it very visually or, or yeah, like this, that you have a container 
which is a framework, and you design that with logic, and uh, that you fuel with input. And we say that the input should come from the outside world. It should come from our nature, human interaction, people, uh, not from within the computer. So you fuel it with the input, and then in this container a process takes place. And that is what we are curious about, what to initi initiate a new process or observing existing process or look at patterns, what patterns emerge. And um, so after having um, written this manifesto, we thought we have to exercise this way of thinking more. And so we um, continue to meet at this Tuesday evening in my kitchen. I was first cooking and then we would make workshops and every week somebody else was responsible for a concept, for a workshop and we every time documented it uh, with a camera or so in, in some way and then put it online on the website conditionaldesign.org. So you see now the archive page of this uh, website and you can check out later all these different workshops. But I um, show you a couple of. And um, well, after a while, it crystallized that the nicest thing to do would be to use paper and pen, because that's a very direct thing. We would sit on this table and you just can react directly and you have a direct, uh, yeah, you see when you draw something on the paper directly, of course. So. Um, it turned out to be a series of, um, you could say, rule-based drawings. Everybody had, every, every week somebody else had to come up with a set of rules. And everybody had the same color pen every week and would even sit at the same spot on the table. So a lot of parameters were at one point set. You didn't have to bother or think about those and just come up with some kind of idea for what would we could draw. And um, um, so what is nice about these drawings were of course that you would not know exactly what shape emerges after um, executing the rule over and over. But uh, another important thing is that we were doing these workshops bloody serious. No, do you say that? <laughs> very seriously. We took it very seriously. We really uh, engaged very much in this and um, because of that uh, it was much more about the dynamics that were happening also during the workshop. So we were discussing, we were fighting, somebody would make mistake. Um, yeah, it was very much about the experience of doing it and also the stories that evolve while doing it. Um, so this, um, yeah, this is how we captured the posters with the camera from top and made a time lapse out of it. And this is an um, example for what how it ended. It was always are difficult to find an end because there is no end in fact yeah you can continue but but more or less the sheet was full so that's why we ended and um, the question is what is it now is it the movie that's capturing the process or is the poster the result yeah it can conform our manifest it is the movie and not this one so but it's uh, always very nice to see the process in the poster itself. Um, this is another example. This is a um, called kaleidoscope. Everybody knows what's a kaleidoscope. And it works like that, that somebody was the leader and the other three were the followers for a couple of seconds, 30 seconds. And then the next one in round would be the leader. And the others always had to mirror live or um, when was somebody was drawing the others. And that was really, really difficult. So you had to really concentrate and be really careful not to make a mistake. Because if you would make a mistake, you were 
uh, you got stuck in a way because then somebody else could continue on your mistake and then you wouldn't know where to continue. And this is, um, yeah, the mistakes are always a very crucial thing because we were already always annoyed if somebody would make a mistake. But uh, on the other hand, later on, if you look at the drawings, the mistakes are those force fields which have most attention where your eyes get stuck so this is actually quite this is what is all about in this case yeah the 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 mistakes that it's not made by a machine so um this is uh oh yeah the, um, uh, we found out that there's three characteristics that deliver the most satisfaction you could say one is the um, where the rules are dealing or playing with the human imperfection with the fact of yeah your yeah human imperfection says it the other one is um, st um, strategy that you would need somebody else to uh, be able to continue so you had to collaborate which these posters are all about it's all about collaboration not about uh, winning or losing or playing against each other and uh, a third one is storytelling when this the, the poster would uh, would emerge a certain story or you had a certain story in your head or what you were drawing you were commenting and so forth so these are the three yeah, characteristics of different series. And now I'm very, very proud to show you uh, the book that is uh, just now finished, that we made uh, from, the, um, from our series, basically. This book, I have it here, is just extra bound one copy so I could bring it here to the walker and also give it as a present to the walker so it's for you and uh, the rest will be bound later on and um, yeah we were working quite long on this book how it should be we wanted to make this book because uh, we have received a lot of response on these uh, workshops a lot of people were interested in it because it's such a playful way to investigate different ways of working. And so, um, yeah, we, we felt it's not so much about how the things look, but to be in the process yourself, do it yourself. So um, that's why it's called a workbook. So we, uh, it's really about understanding how this works and do it also. Um, it's uh, published by Valise, a Dutch publisher, and the designer is Julia Born, which we're really happy with because uh, she's an excellent book designer. You might uh, know her. <coughs> so I will show you a couple of pages of the book now. Um, the book contains uh, 10 workshops. We made more, but this is a selection. And uh, this is an introduction page. And uh, this is an example of a very simple workshop. It's, uh, you have to draw a perfect circle. And uh, this uh, book is, the concept is like that. You, on every page is one sentence. So if the rule set is rather complex, the workshop has more pages if the rule set is very simple it has less pages so it's corresponding every page one sentence in this case yeah it has three pages and um, you might notice that the skin color is really red we I look really sunburnt here and uh, this is due to the fact that the book is printed with the original four uh, pen or adding colors this red and the blue and the green and the black and so the lithography made is made in such a way that uh, the drawing itself is in its original colors and the rest of the photograph is neglected so the CMYK is uh, 
not CYK, it's just these four adding colors. And uh, yeah, this is an example for a, a little bit more complex workshop. It's called knots. We were drawing knots. Sometimes we refer um, to real world, uh, make real world re references. So slowly get entangled. You had to loop your line over another color, over and under another color. And um, I remember that Jonathan was red and he tried to be stay in the circle in the center and others were making much bigger curves. So you also had always your individual um, character within your drawing in effect. There are different uh, examples um, where we were blindfolded. So every workshop deals with a different concept. We were folding paper or making more of um, like a feedback loop. Here, this one's dealing with that. Or trying to draw without stopping. And this is a page because uh, we have two texts in the book and one is uh, written by Andrew Blaufeld that you probably know. <laughs> so uh, it is a really beautiful text he wrote about um, conditional design and placing it into a historical context. And then this page shows uh, our conditional design glossary. And the uh, glossary is, consists of about 50 words that um, we chose because we use them a lot and because they are important for our terminology or for our vocabulary. And the definitions are in such a way how we use those words. So not necessarily um, definitions that are generally valid. So by reading only those glo this glossary, you already get a quite good idea, I think. Um, now I show you another web project. So we were doing all this um, um, hand drawings and we got really into this fact of uh, placing the um, making these hand drawings in an almost computational setting you could say where you really then focus on the expression of the individual or the person or the, the hand and um, so this is, you could see in this, uh, in a row of, of these drawings. This is an applied um, work. It is a website for Metamatic Research Initiative. Irma Bohm, that you might know as well. She has been talking here some time ago. Um, she made an uh, identity for, the, for this in initiative and asked us to make the website. So um, the Metamatic Research initi Initiative, I have to um, mention, is an initiative by two art collectors that are completely fascinated by the drawing machines from Jean Tanguely. And I quickly show you these, um, um, how this looks like, this uh, drawing, um, yeah, drawing machine. This is it. Uh, the drawing machine from Jean Tanguely is uh, made in the 60s and he was almost like it was the start or maybe setting the tone for generative art because he would make um, these uh, wheels where he would attach a pen and a paper and then the machine would run and the pen would wiggle or the whole machine would wiggle but it would make this uh, expressive drawing and the museum visitors they could take the drawing home and um, so he plays with the f idea that the machine is making the drawing he's questioning the authorship anyway of the artist here and uh, that the machine would make an expressive drawing and um, I uh, really like this um, idea, or it, you could, it was very similar to our fascination where he would make the machine that would generate this drawing. We would 
create a situation, make this rule set where humans would generate this drawing. And so the idea was to ask um, a selected group of artists to make a tribute to Jean Tangeli by making a machine drawing. And um, yeah, what is a machine drawing? It is in fact a method to make a mathematical drawing. So we send a letter to uh, we send a letter to the group of artists, and I think it's also important that we it is selected group of artists. So it is a bit uh, elite or exclusive. And they were asked to um, draw a shape on the paper and repeat the shape to its outside until the paper is full and repeat it to the inside. Um, and it would also say that you need some fascination for repetition and change. And we got quite a lot of uh, response, which is really nice because it's takes quite an effort to make such a drawing. It's really quite a renowned artist also um, have been drawing, making these drawings. And um, these are examples. So we left open what kind of pen they should use. They should use a ball pen, but then not what color. And you see a very beautiful here the where you would start the circle or the, the shape and end it again by this little bold uh, spots. What is really nice to see the different ideas, how people solved it, how to close it into the center, and of course variations. So um, these shapes were then um, put online on a web website. It's called Human Interference Project. Oh, no, I put it. Uh, so um, yeah, this is the what we got back. You see, quite uh, quite a lot. And uh, if you click on it, you can. Uh, make it alive. So here the your mouse turns into the shape. And then it is intentionally of course asked to make this drawing because of its interference or moiré patterns that it's creating. So you can play here with it. And um, it's always not so easy to give a live presentation, web. <laughs> um, so, now I go back to where I've been. Um, yeah, so, but this uh, website I just uh, showed is only the background for this one, this is the main side, and um, here the side, the longer you're on the side, the more full it gets. So the shapes are interfering here with each other, but also with the content of the side, because the shapes are also live uh, masked into the uh, images. Um, And also in the text. If you roll over, it disappears. You can read it. So this is a sort of um, environment that it gets very. You can see it sometimes stare at it for hours because it's very beautiful, or it is becoming also very annoying or dirty or whatever how you would call it. You can control the shapes by when once you scroll, you can make it accelerate them or make them stop. So you see uh, how it is somehow a free work or some kind of initiative, but in the same time also an applied functional website. 
So I go now to another machine concept, which is uh, called laptop reflections. And uh, laptop reflection is um, dealing with this machine here, our laptops, and um, our behavior, daily behavior with it. We made this uh, for a um, exhibition in uh, Breda, somewhere in Holland, for the Graphic Design Museum. And um, what we did is uh, we made a screenshot, no, we installed a script on us. I must say it is Jonathan, Ruhl, Edo and me doing this project together, the four of us. And everybody of us has in fact the same computer. So we all have this little camera, the eyesight camera on top of our laptop. And we all the four have then this script installed, which would take a picture of me as soon as I open the laptop uh, every five minutes during nine months and but not only it would not only photograph uh, take a photograph but it also would make a screenshot of I would what I would work on right now at that moment so these images these two images together were overlaid and um, as if the um, and mirrored the, the the screen dump is mirrored as if you to create the illusion somebody would look from the back of your screen towards you so these are the four four of us and um, to maybe refer to conditional design and how we framed this uh, terminology you must imagine the framework here is the, uh, or the condition is the um, every five minutes shooting the, the, the picture that is shot and um, input uh, the four of us or everything behind the screen. And um, so you wonder what is going on. Here, this is a time lapse of uh, nine months where all the four of us are next, sat next to each other, are put next to each other just for the purpose of this presentation, is not uh, installed in this way. And um, now I show, of course, only an excerpt. Well, <coughs> this uh, is a very rigid, you could say, a ri rigid setup, all this every five minutes, this, uh, uh, have this photo taken, but at the same time, this rigidity is um, broken by its um, virtuosity. Virtu it's very virtuous. It's very organic. It feels very emotional. Or yeah. Um, so the relationship changed dramatically with our laptop during this period. Yeah, it was uh, that um, it became really uh, a partner almost, or you would really personify this machine. Yeah. It was incredible after a while when we would. Um, go somewhere, look at any other screen, for example, in the city, in the shop window, you would always have the feeling somebody would look back at you, or you would watch TV, then you always had the idea of, oh, maybe I'm watched. The sound, we not only captured the um, these two pictures, but also which programming programs we were working on, and the sound is generated based on what kind of program we are working on in that moment. So it's always uh, this two-way, uh, if you set up the system, it's this two-way interaction. You, the user or the participant and the system. You're in this two-way relationship and you can play with it. You can cheat, you can modify it or you, it is this friction taking place. I think that's a very important uh, idea to keep in mind. You need always this uh, 
relationship going on. Uh, this is the in, uh, uh, um, space where the movies were installed. Uh, to the right there were the screens and the back is another project of ours where we captured the sky above Amsterdam but I'm not going to show this also in the same pace, also every five minutes so you would see what's going on outside and then the whole archive is displayed here on the left on a big wall you see the four of us next to each other, our, our images uh, you must read it like that, it is a vertical uh, one strip is um, one day. It's like about 288 images if you would have it uh, fully going. And so you see um, at, the at the top starts at 12 o'clock in the night and it goes down. And then you see, of course, uh, very well when you're getting up. At that time, Rul had was the only one with kids, so um, he would have a very regular moment when he would get up. So it's a visualization of how we deal with our machine, with our laptops. And how, yeah. So um, in order, because it was so small on the wall, and to get a better idea of the whole material, we also made this website, laptopreflections.org. Um, we use uh, Google Maps technology. You can uh, zoom in slowly and um, see better the four of us. You can switch also on the right up. You see you can switch between the different people. So you can see at one day who's doing what. <laughs> it's <laughs> really crazy. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, this, this is a nice shot, I think, where you see Jonathan having a different color shirt every day. It's like a gradient. <laughs> and um, yeah, it is of course very confronting how you look on these. But actually it is not so much about how you look, it is also became very much what does he see? Because yeah. Um, now, this was a very sort of neutral uh, visualization on the wall and we went through all this material and also um, made us collections of moments that we thought were interesting or were, were we realized. Yeah, so um, on the website you can make these tours that you can choose and I will show you now a very few collections that I thought were nice to show and uh, one phenomenon is that you always have somebody a lot of times watching over your shoulder into your screen so actually um, it's not only uh, he's not only looking at you but you showing or demonstrating something on the screen so you always uh, mostly there is a problem or there's something really special you are also very concentrated what is going on there? What has to be fixed or <laughs> what has to be shared? And then another thing I realized, he's not only looking into my face or my head, but he's looking at the other parts of my body as well. and also moments of uh, where things went wrong. <laughs> yeah, it goes on like this, I can tell you. <laughs> it's very confronting. Uh, and, and then, of course, it witnesses also these bad habits we have. <laughs> yeah. So, um, um, these, all these projects deal, in fact, with man-machine relationship. And a um, very important topic within this man-machine relationship concept is also tools and designing your own tools. Uh, to place it again in the 
context of conditional design, the tool is here the framework or the logic that you set up yourself and the input is the one uh, using the tool, the user in fact, with your hand or with your mind, what you do with it. And uh, we do a lot of, uh, we have been designing a lot of tools ourselves, especially because Jonathan is uh, also a very good programmer and um, he also help developing, for example, scriptographer, the scripting environment within Illustrator that Hugh Laney has set up. And uh, we use that still quite a lot. So um, Jonathan has uh, made this little tool. Actually, it is more or less a shape, a square shape which is with two poles, so it becomes a sign. So once you click and drag, there comes this uh, sign out of your mouse. And um, if you connect them all together, which the tool allows, it has a certain function, it looks like a fence. So this uh, might look very limited. What can you do with it? Well. We decided we use this for uh, identity. Um, for a big company, this is actually um, very nice for you to see also. A commercial client of ours uh, that is called Unity 3D, and they produce software for uh, 3D game engines. And uh, they've been having a conference in Amsterdam and we did the identity for this conference and now more but I will tell you later about this um, so this is an example for a poster we did for this conference and uh, it is like this if you start with a tool you think like hey what can I do with it but slowly by working with it more and more it slowly gets alive only once you start also telling stories. So we told stories to each other what it could be. So that in this case, that little sign was becoming a little creature. So people were standing around, chatting, uh, waiting at the entrance for the conference, lining up. I'm pro sure they were also visiting the sculpture garden somewhere. And here they are uh, waiting or they're, they're taking part in the keynote presentation somewhere else yeah they were I don't know playing ping pong so it is uh, as soon as you draw with this tool you start to develop ideas also what to do and what it means so it is almost a bit compared to um, the fungo series that I showed at the beginning where it flips between being completely uh, an abstract shape or it becomes a small story, depending on what you want to see as well. This is an example for a big screen in a, um, uh, in a, a keynote presentation in Amsterdam. And um, what is uh, very nice that this uh, company is very open for all these, uh, you could call playful, um, things that we do with this tool and uh, because you would usually expect that the 3D game engine company would make rather or the, the, the games themselves are highly um, complex 3D visuals and what we do is purely a simple black and white shape with this not 3D, it's fake 3D, it's just how you draw it, that you play something behind each other, that's what makes it 3D. So it's very nice that they really liked it and continued um, to embrace this. And um, <clears throat> there's now many more conferences because it's growing very quickly in, for example, uh, Asia. We are <clears throat> having right now, uh, making a lot of derivatives like cups, bags, um, t-shirts, screens for the conference, 
banners, flags, all these kind of things only with this tool. And um, yeah, this is for example a keynote screen in, in, in China. And uh, this is a print for a t-shirt. So uh, unfortunately, because I decided to show you something what we're working on very recent now, uh, I don't have documentation pictures of the final products. But nevertheless, I think you get an idea. So you can think at one point you have really drawn everything you could with this little tool, but then of course it continues and you come up with a new plan and new ideas. And you also see very well the um, different characters, who's drawing with it. Um, could even say who is drawing with the tool. You can even tell on the, the signature of it. And this is also very important once you use the tools that you really have to become friends with it in a way. You have to master it, work with it and uh, slowly, but probably job, not job, job, sorry, job, <laughs> last week was talking about that a lot, becoming the master of your own tool. And... Um, yeah, so it's also here this uh, relationship between the the tool that makes you, allows you to draw work in a certain way, and you, the user of the tool. And uh, now the last thing I would like to show is uh, the newest um, tool we're making for the current conference, the the coming, the big conference that's coming up in Vancouver in uh, the summer and it is inspired by this uh, um, fantastic mural from Solovit. He makes all these fantastic murals with these cubes and other shapes but uh, so this is um, it's inspired by this one. Uh, what the tool can do you can see here you click and you drag and then it would produce a cube for you. So the cube can have different heights and different width. It is different to, we chose to, uh, the cube that you just, just saw from Solovit had different hatchings. Um, on the different sides. We chose to have the cover though blank to make it not too confusing. Um, the hatching, no matter what you draw, exactly stays in the same distance. So the cube can be also open, it becomes a box. You see that the inside, the direction of the hatching inside of the box has a different angle. It's vertical, where it's outside, it is horizontal. So that gives you a, a spatial, more spatial idea. Um, you can leave away some sides. You can change the angle of the, the isometric angle of the box that you want to draw with the tool. You can add flaps and then you can combine the shapes of course and then you can make these small architectures with it. And I really love this architectural quality actually of it. So I'm really glad, looking forward to play with it more. You can combine these uh, boxes, put them inside each other and also create this illusion, optical illusions. And this time we also decided to add a circle, which is a little creature that can interact with these uh, architectural shapes. So these are the things that we can do with it. And this is an example for a um, email header, in fact. So this is like, you can imagine, it's like a factory, small factory, where there's little creatures go through. This is how they are, we would use them. So we're making this uh, 
illustrations for all different kinds of, uh, as I said, derivatives. So this is uh, just now the start, what we are working on right now, building a world with it. Um, it is very difficult uh, still to find out uh, what level on what level of detail you should work on in, in, with this hatching, what works well and what works less well. Yeah, it is a sort of um, interaction still. We have still have to get very good friends with each other, the tool and we. So, um, yeah, this is actually my last slide that I wanted to show for today. And uh, maybe to conclude, or to make a bridge to the previous projects, uh, is that no matter whether you're using the tool or whether you're designing the system, it's always about this engagement that you have within this environment that you're working in, the friction. I think it's always important that the machine talks back or the tool talks back, yeah, this friction and interaction going on. So. That is it. Thank you very much. I have no idea how, what time is it? Is it? Is it? Is, is, um, am I short or long? You want to know what this is? This is um, another tool we made. Um, it's a ball with a camera inside that we threw into the public. And live, you would see on the screen the, what the camera films. In this case, we had two cameras inside, one high-speed camera and a normal, regular network camera. This was taking place at uh, a big music festival in uh, the Netherlands. I thought it's a nice uh, background image for answering questions. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm wondering how, how the actual process of designing has, ch has changed from when you started as a designer, which I assume was in a more traditional sort of sense of solving a project and working with a tradi more traditional set of aesthetics, and now kind of working with these logical parameters and big data sets. What is it like on a day-to-day -day basis when, you, when you're actually in that creative flow? Uh, how is it different, and what have you learned from this new approach? Hmm. Well, um, what is very much different is that uh, when you set up the system and then you leave your hands away, that you're much more busy with um, the production of the project. You have an idea and a concept, you don't exactly know what's happening. So it's not that you, maybe in a traditional sense, you would slowly shape something and it has the perfect shape. In this case, you have to set up the machine or you have to set up the environment and then let it run. So this is a very different way of working and sometimes not even so satisfying because, yeah, it's it, it's a collaborative thing with, with the rest. So you have much less control over it and uh, yeah, you're designing much less. That's, in fact, the case. Yeah. Is that... Uh, Going to the question? No, I mean, you've seen that I've shown also the, the tool example at the end, which is going in a different direction where you're really much more controlling the product. You're much more in control of what's coming out. 
And um, I also like to do that. But uh, yeah, I'm still very much fascinated about the fact of letting a process emerge from something that you set up. For example, at the beginning, what I have shown when you were speaking, um, the identity there is still in the making um, with the sentences that have been rewritten. Yeah, I have no idea exactly what will come out. So this is a very, yeah, it's a machine that's still running. Uh, is there a place where we can play with some of the software tools that you've developed? Yes, sure. Uh, you can directly go to uh, scriptographer.com. No, dot org, sorry. <laughs> and uh, there, there are lots of tools that you can use and play with, but uh, we don't put all our tools there. There are some of our tools online, but not all of them. For example, the ones we're working right now, of course, they are not only made for this one purpose, and they're not, uh, we won't put them there. But there are a lot of other ones. And there's also another um, new um, scripting environment called Paper.js, which, which is made for the web, which is similar to Scriptographer, but then online. So there, it's, it's the same principle. There you can also see a lot of examples of different tools or filters or yeah, interactive ideas. Yeah, Paper GS, it's called. For your sticker pieces, which are very reactionary, who puts down the first pieces? Yeah. Um, uh, it was the most of the times the curator of the exhibition. It was like a bit uh, putting into scene, like now who's placing the first sticker, and then the curator would everybody would look, and then the curator would make the first, and then the rest of the audience would continue, and then for the rest I don't know. Huh? For the rest it just continues during the course of the months. Good question, though. Where do you place it? Huh? What and which way does it influence the rest? Hi. Um, I wonder if you could talk. Well, conditional design. I'm assuming someone's taken these ideas and then the notion of the input and the tools and gone someplace really crazily different than you intended, and not maybe even in something that results in some visual presentation. Is there an example out there that you can think of that you know went really far with it to a place where you're maybe not even sure it is what you were doing, but you still, I don't know, it still has a kind of sense of integrity and excitement for you, and could you talk a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to disappoint you a little bit because I, um, we get a lot of reactions of people that do also these workshops and that use that as a, I don't know now the word, as a, as a starting point. And I see beautiful examples there, but it's still the same principle. It's not like a completely different way. It's just to, uh, it's different ideas in which way they would draw or what media they would use. But it's not, I, I cannot see, I cannot tell you that something really strange would have happened. But I can tell you that it has been uh, embraced really far abroad even to Australia and people from all over the world are um, mailing us with questions or inviting us to come give workshops, which we actually don't like to do because um, we cannot repeat ourselves too many times. Therefore, we also made this book because you just can do it yourself. Yeah. No, no completely crazy examples. I'm sorry. I was hoping someone had like switched the notion of the input and the you know like yeah. where the behavior becomes. Yeah. I don't know. But anyway. Yeah, I mean, there. I somebody told me a student um, from the Reed field was that I think he would um, draw him using the feedback idea, but the feedback idea is also in these workshops that he would. Uh, 
photograph himself and then would project or filmed himself and project that on the wall and then would try to stage again what he would see. So it is the circle going on. So this is a very nice uh, related idea you could say. So yourself the, uh, the input and the output. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm wondering about the, the this kind of feeling I get with some of the work and how you think about this in relationship to the work yourself, which is this kind of call to participation, or almost like the setting up of a of a somewhat democratic interactive field, which actually then has sort of very narrow rules attached, mm -hmm. which determine um, how how you as a sort of you know, person in the public sphere or whatever can engage. Um, do you worry at all about how strictly, how strict and sort of confined those modes of engagement become? And I'm thinking mm -hmm. about it in relationship to your own work, but also into like broader questions to do with museums or general mm -hmm. sort of um, a call to sort of participation, which I often feel is like a very, um, is not actually as generous as it might set itself up to seem. Yeah, it's interesting what you say. What do you mean? It's not as generous as it seems. So actually, the museum or the one that is setting it up wants something back. Yeah. And they've defined the structure very narrowly, in, in a sense. Or there's, there's such a defined structure that um, there's this kind of idea of, of engagement or this idea of a call or an invitation and yet at the same time the modes of that engagement is so strictly delineate, delineated that it's merely the illusion of, of mm -hmm. participation. Yeah, yeah. What? Like having the, re the audience read your words. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and I know you're very aware of it. Like, I mean, you talk yeah, about yeah. the masses versus the multitude and so on. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, we made a lot of different uh, projects also where that um, where we felt, okay, this is not interesting now. For example, in, um, in a museum we were uh, told that um, there are lots of people coming. So we thought of a very simple action. So you had to glue a sticker. We were drawing some kind of patterns that were also generative in a way on the floor. And then uh, the, the, the visitors had to draw a sticker on these lines. And there were certain junctions. Anyway, I don't have to explain exactly maybe the whole, it, whole how it works. But there you had very little impact on how the shape would evolve. Just some people and some junction could determine how the shape would evolve further. And that was clearly not so satisfying. So we, uh, it looks beautiful if you look at the, the documentation of the work, but it was not satisfying for the, for the participant. So there is, uh, it's very true what you say, there has to be something in that you get back, the reward I was talking about, or something that you can play with, that you feel this is fun or this is nice. And it is very much about yeah, how much freedom and then too much freedom is not interesting neither, because then it's getting, oh, I do whatever I want, and then there's no engagement neither. So it's very um, listening quite tight. That's what I also uh, have been talking at the beginning about, or this example that is always about this limitation and freedom and the amount of which, how, mu how fun it is. If you can glue with the stickers whatever you like, because you have so many stickers, it's also boring. So, yeah. Yeah, what is the reward, you could ask? Eh? What, what do you get back? because you're part of a bigger bigger piece. That's a lot of time very nice if you experience that. You will see yourself later in a movie. So with uh, the multi multitude of all your voices. That's what you get back. Hey. I was wondering if you could talk about the working relationship within your group. You mentioned that um, Jonathan 
is up here. <laughs> Who's asking? Oh, there, yeah. <laughs> uh, you mentioned that Jonathan is the main programmer, yeah. the main developer, is that correct? Yeah. And then, so do you all, are you all equally creative and do you all write code and is there, how does that relationship work? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we are all equally creative. <laughs> I'm the least creative <laughs> now. <laughs> no, uh, but uh, Jonathan is the only one that can program. Rule and me, we also have an understanding of uh, technology in a way. Rule even more than I have, but I also have some. I mean, it compares to depends on what you compare to. But we're not program. We're not programming. But um, yeah, of course there are. Our roles switch a lot also, you know, depending on what project you work on. Um, yeah. I, can, I, I can't and I don't want to pinpoint now, you know. John is always programming, Ruth is always doing video, and I'm always doing a sticker project. It's not like that at all. So it's, it's uh, um, everybody is doing everything in a way, yeah. And that's also really nice, otherwise it would become also very... Um, yeah, one-sided. Jonathan wouldn't be the want to be only the programmer. We also have other people program things because there's so much need to be programmed. What should we do? That he is actually not capable of doing it all by himself. Yeah. Um, so my question is, what what do you see you and your group doing in ten years? Like, yeah, yeah. where does this grow mm -hmm. to, and what do you want to be doing? Yeah, uh, it is a very good question. Mm, I think I realize now, since we are a group of three, I don't want to grow being a big company. Not. I want to really like stay like that. We have one intern and we have one uh, production uh, manager. So that is exactly enough. Maybe we could have need some programming help. So uh, then it concerning, I mean, what we try to do is not making experimental work for entry cultural institutions or for just for ourselves, and then making applied work which is very uh, boring and regular. So I think what we still try to do and what we will do and I hope that will stay the same is try to use this experimentation within applied work and also within commercial work so I think that is maybe the, the, the biggest challenge to do also commercial work and not only stay in a cultural sector with, with this experimentation yeah that is I like that idea in fact because also, if you think more in a commercial world, it's, it's a bigger audience, and I think that's also nice that you don't stay always in this niche, but yeah, you have a bigger audience. Hey, um, I have a question from Twitter, um, from iTeeth. Um, can you give an example of a time when you've established rules, then decided to break them in a conditional design project? So where we established rules and, and broke them again. Then decided to break them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we have made one workshop where we every round you had to invent a new rule. So it's not breaking it, but just adding one after the other. So you would just draw a line a certain way, and then next next round you had another one and another one, and it get more and more complex. So that's one example. But I think the question is more related to breaking it down, being unsatisfied, or changing it while doing it. The thing is that there is not such a thing as this is not right or not good because we would just do it and then it would we didn't really like it at the end we just wow so what we just do another one next one next week so it was not that mm, when doing it we really changed it dramatically now 
<clears throat> but of course, when you develop the rule set, you um, for yourself, you like the day when we do did it. Mostly on the same day during the day, you would think, hey, okay, what can we do in the evening? And then you would try something out, and you had some little idea, and then you make a little exercise or experiment, and then you would say, okay, this maybe is not. Yeah, interesting or there it didn't really work well because yeah you have certain kind of expectations and then in this development uh, yeah you you change a lot but this is goes really quick this is close like within an hour something like that okay, thank yeah you very much. okay